Have you ever been obsessed by a dream? Or consumed by a burning passion that drives you forward, regardless of what stands in your way? That's me on June 15, 1972, and as you can see, my pals and I filmed our last day of high school, and yes, I somehow graduated from Whittier High, the alma mater of President Richard M. Nixon, class of 1930. Our graduation ceremony was just one day before the Watergate break-in. That was just the beginning of a sequence of fateful events that would shape both of our lives. It was an election year, and in case you're wondering, I voted for my Quester Grand Prix co-conspirator Randy Green, who was Whittier High's student body president. Randy would be off to college in the fall. Thankfully, my pal Wayne Summers would stick around and become part of my next adventure. Our posse would also lose Bob Pellisier and Drew Summers when they both moved off to college, so it was time to rebuild the crew. Most of us were growing up and changing fast, so was the world around us. I'll admit that I was a lap behind and depressed at leaving all my smart and fun friends in my art class. But the hardest part was saying goodbye to Mark Bermudez, our amazing art teacher. I would simulate attending college in the fall but I already knew what I really wanted to do. So did my new, talented friend, Mike Van Adder, who loved racing and art as much as I did. But let me rewind to Halloween weekend in 1971. Mike and I attended the Times Grand Prix SCCA Can-Am finale at Riverside International Raceway. We went legit and purchased tickets and garage passes. I had a blast recording our antics with my Polaroid camera. We were also inspired by George Bartel's fantastic race program cover illustration. Now we were determined to use our artistic talents to earn our place in the sport. As the green flag flew, I felt the spark of ambition. But life doesn't always follow our plans. Around the same time, the honeymoon was sadly over for my mom and dad. Ron Fanner's constant travel and relentless pressure of the Apollo program had damaged their already fragile marriage, so he dove even deeper into his work. Now he was working on Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, and a new reusable spacecraft that I knew very little about. Dad still spent time with me, but he favored my middle school age sister Diane for good reason. Unlike her brother, Sis was mature for her age and a straight-A student. Annoyingly, she could also beat me racing slot cars and go-karts, which sucked. After graduation, I was lost, and I wasn't really ready to become an adult. Mike and I spent most of our evenings in the summer of 1972 at his home, hijacking his kid brother's Hot Wheels Sizzler set while we were trying to figure out what came next for us. I was searching for inspiration and motivation. In contrast, my hero Mario Andretti was in a season of ambitious extremes. He joined Parnelli Jones' IndyCar Super Team with Al Unser and Joe Leonard. His role at Ferrari had expanded from Formula One to the World Sports Car Championship. Mario and his teammate Jack Eakes won four races, including Daytona, Sebring, and Brands Hatch, to deliver the title for Enzo Ferrari, with another win at Watkins Glen late in July. Unlike my hero, I was struggling to find first gear. In early August, I turned 18 and I fell back into making fake credentials for the third annual California 500 at Ontario Motor Speedway. I enlisted Mike's help and the quality of our forge passes moved to another level. At the same time, racing cars were moving to another level in technology and speed. With our improved fake passes, we had the opportunity to get close to my hero, Dan Gurney, and witness history when his number two driver, Jerry Grant, became the first person to officially record a 200 mile per hour lap. I created paintings that I presented to Bobby Unser and Roger McCluskey. On race day, we finally got to stand on the grid of an IndyCar race, but what came later was even better. Roger McCluskey won the California 500. After Roger accepted the trophy from none other than Richard Nixon's daughter, Trisha, he invited us to join him in the track president's suite to celebrate with his team. 
As I looked out over the vast empty speedway that evening from the suite's balcony, I felt a new sense of purpose and optimism as I reflected on how far I'd come since the year before. I knew I belonged here, and it seemed like racing was really taking off and entering a far more professional high-tech era. One team in particular embodied the changing image and mindset of the sport. Now there's a new force to be reckoned with. The car, a Porsche 91710, powered by a 900 horsepower turbocharged engine, was built to put an end to the McLaren supremacy. The nucleus of the operation is Roger Penske. Roger, having retired as a driver, teamed with Mark Donahue, a graduate engineer from Brown University. The team has set the standard of excellence for the racing world, and finally in May of 1972, taking the most coveted prize of all, the Indianapolis 500. Looking for new areas to conquer, Penske Racing has decided to apply its so-called magic touch to the Can-Am series. Inspired by Roger Penske's team, naturally Mike and I decided to start a company in my mom's garage called Brazewood Graphics. In mid-October, we drove north to Laguna Seca for the SCCA Can-Am event, where Penske's L&M Porsches would be racing. Mike and I were on a mission to launch our company. We would create four art prints of the top Can-Am cars based on reference images shot by our high school friend, Rob Gloy. Instead of faking passes, we worked hard and fast to create the drawings, packaging, and our business cards in time for the season finale at Riverside International Raceway two weeks later. We did a deal with the track's management to set up a folding table next to the snack bar by the paddock and pit area gate. We sold more than 50 sets of prints for $10 each. We also attracted our first paying client. His name is Alan Bouverat, the man behind Autosport Promotions in Torrance, California. Alan is a former racer who managed sponsorships and sales for teams and drivers. Mike and I were soon cranking out sponsorship proposal illustrations at all levels of the sport. Beyond our interest in art, our dream was to race an SCCA Formula Ford because we believed that this was the path to the top of the sport. We would fund our racing from the huge profits from our illustration and design work that were sure to come. At least that was the plan. In early December, we were hanging out with our pal Wayne Summers when we saw an ad in Auto Week for a new racing car called the Eldon Mark 8 that was touted as the world's fastest Formula Ford. Even though we had no money, we called the local dealer and we were invited to come in that evening to see the car. The three of us crammed into my tiny MGB sports car, and after a miserable drive in LA rush hour traffic, we arrived at Automotive Development in Orange, California. We were greeted by sales manager Dick Cooney, who showed us a beautiful new Eldon Mark 8. Cooney then invited me to slip into the cockpit, and he uttered the immortal words, You look good in there. I was hooked. Then we noticed a wreck race car in the corner of the shop. To my amazement, this was what was left of the futuristic Formula Ford that I'd seen at the Quester Grand Prix in March of 1971. It was called the Home Built, and it was designed by a young racer named David Bruns, who worked as an engineer at McDonnell Douglas. Although we had no money to buy an Eldon, that night we managed to sell our illustration services to Automotive Development's co-founder, Paul White. He soon gave us a clay model to use as a basis to create illustrations of David's next advanced design that would be called the ADF Mark II. Paul hoped that this would pave the way for the company to reach the highest levels of the sport. Just five months after graduating high school, we were inside the sport and anything was now possible. In mid-December, Apollo 17 marked the end of an era for mankind and for my family. The last Apollo astronauts left the moon, and we haven't been back since. Three, two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. But as I looked up at the moon on that chilly December night, I said goodbye to my childhood and embraced what promised to be a life-changing year ahead. 